Okay, so uh, today we do hearing. And um, again, it, it's, it's a sense that is often underappreciated. Um, we, without hearing, we feel, we would feel, I think, very isolated, especially from so, social contact. Um, you can imagine sitting at a dinner table and the conversation is going on and you not being able to participate in it. Um, it's also useful for, for all kinds of other things. Uh, uh, if you have a hearing, if you if a child and you're hard of hearing, you often dis misdiagnosed as someone having a cognitive impairment. And of course, sound is very important for your safety. Uh, when you're walking down the street with your eye on your uh, smartphone, uh, sound is especially important to tell you that you're not going to walk into a, a, a car or something like that. And it could be very aggravating when it goes wrong. Um, tinnitus is a sort of ringing in the ears. I don't know how many of you get that, but as you get older, it becomes more and more prevalent and it get, could be very annoying. So what is sound? Well, um, sound occurs, what you need for sound is, is something that's vibrating. You need air to transmit the sound and your ear to pick it up and the ear in turn to convert it to um, electrical activity. So, so what you saw there was, was these pressure waves. Uh, we'll try that again. You can see this is creates pressure waves. Each vibration creates a And that in turn moves your eardrum here, and that in turn causes all the stuff that we'll talk about in the rest of the lecture. Now, sound can be soft or loud. And the only difference between the two is the height, the, the, how much compression occurs. So the compression waves are bigger or smaller. The speaker moves less or more. And, and in turn, this, the, the eardrum here has a bigger vibration or a smaller vibration. The other thing that can happen is that you can change frequency. You can see here uh, a rapid vibration of the drum and these waves very close together. Or you can see them far apart and these waves also far apart. Now, we can, your, your ear is able to detect anywhere from 20 to 20,000 vibrations per second. That's what hurts me. And um, at least in you younger folks, as we get older, this range becomes smaller and smaller. The, the range that's very important is this 2,000 to 4,000 hertz, which is so the range of frequencies um, that the spoken word produces. So not, 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 not the, the high operatic sounds that you hear, but just the spoken words. Now, how does it, we saw the eardrum vibrating, this is out here. How does this vibration over here become converted to electrical activity? Well, you have to pass through these different parts of the ear. The first is, is out here where we have, again, air, because that's, that's the, the eardrum is surrounded by air. Then we go to the middle ear, which again is filled with air. And it contains these bones that are called ossicles. And these ossicles convert the vibration that occurs in your eardrum into this beginning part of whatever it is that's over here. And whatever it is over here is called a cochlea. It's called a cochlea because it has the, this coil snail shape. Okay. And so it's wider over here and it gets narrower, narrower, narrower as you go around. And it's over here that we have the neurons that convert the 
by vibrate vibrations into electrical activity. So you saw there that, that what the ossicles did was transmit from the eardrum to the oval window. So this moves, that moves in turn. And I forgot to mention, but it's very important, this, this part here, the inner ear, is filled with fluid. Okay, so everything here is fluid filled. Now, one of the problems with fluid is you got to move it. Okay? And you can think of your air molecules as these small little molecules, and the fluid inside this part as being these big molecules. And if you hit them directly, all the energy in these small molecules just simply bounces off. It's like trying to hit a billiard ball with a uh, ping pong ball. The ping pong ball will just bounce off. It won't cause this molecule to move. And you want these molecules to move to get this vibration over to the side. So what we have is, is these ossicles produce something called impedance matching. And impedance matching means they act like a lever. They lack, if you, if you try to um, uh, change your tires on your car, you need to lift the tire, crank it up, um, and that's a lever, because you, you can push on this handle and lift this giant-sized car. So what you need here is a lever. And that's what these bones do. See, that they, 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 you've got this, they have this lever effect. First, because you've got this big, big eardrum pushing this tiny, tiny window here, um, and secondly, because these bones make a sort of lever system themselves. Um, and as a result now, you've got these molecules inside the fluid moving. So that's what impedance matching is. The other thing these things do is they do something called gating. So attach these bones are these muscles. And you can contract these muscles under two conditions. One is um, when you, before you speak, every time, just before you speak, these muscles contract. Because your own voice, especially if you try to speak loudly, um, can damage your, 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 these hairs in your, in your, in your inside here. Uh, and also, they, they, they contract after a, a loud sound. So they can't protect you from something like a, a gunshot that's unexpectedly shot near your ear, because that's unexpected. They can't contract fast enough. But they can protect you from a, a loud environment, like you're walking into a rock concert or something like that. They will contract fiercely and keep the, these, these neurons safe or as safe as they can. Now, beside this oval window, which, which is what this, the, this lever pushes, you have this round window. And the question is, why is it there? Well, this is this cochlea, and we've unrolled it just for make, the sake of simplicity. And inside the cochlea, we have this Basler membrane. It's a membrane that sort of cuts across half this can. And you could imagine if this was a can, it was filled with fluid. And this uh, brown window wasn't here. You couldn't push on this fluid. Okay? Even though this was soft rubber thing, it couldn't compress the fluid inside here. And as a result, you wouldn't be able to push into it. And you wouldn't be able to def deflect this basilar membrane. So this round window is a release outlet that allows whatever you push here to act on the basilar membrane and therefore push out over here. So without this round window, the 
the basal membrane would move. Now, on this basal membrane, we've got hair cells. Okay, um, and this, these hair cells, they're neurons, and they're connected to your eighth nerve, which sends a signal down to a brainstem. And they bend whenever the basal membrane bends. So when the sound deflects the basal membrane, you get this bending of the hair cells. Well, what does bending the hair cells do? Well, bending the hair cells does this. On the, from connecting one hair cell to the next one, you've got this little flap that opens. So when it bends in one direction, the flap opens. When it bends in the other direction, the flap closes. And as it opens and closes, potassium enters the cell and depolarizes the cell. So that's why these hairs have this crew-cut shape with a tall kind of cilium over here and these short fibers down the rest of the way to allow these little tiny filaments to open the flap. So you can imagine this is a, a very delicate device. You've got a hair cell, it's a little tiny neuron, this thing over here, the big thing. And here it has on it tiny hairs. And on each of these hairs, you have a tiny filament. So you can imagine that this is a pretty delicate structure. And when you put earphones on and turn up the volume, you pose a lot of risk to this tiny delicate structure. So what happens? When this presses, this oval window, it initiates this little bulge. And what's neat is that little bulge travels down the basilar membrane. More importantly, the wave as it travels down gets bigger and then smaller again. And, okay, so, so it, it changes size. Now, what you saw there was that it was a different size depending on the, what the frequency was. I'll play that again. We had high frequencies over here and low frequencies over here. And this caused most of the big vibrations at this end of the basal membrane and the low frequencies vibrations at that end of the basal membrane. So this end vibrates most for the high frequencies, this for low frequencies, and everything in between. You've got, on this basal membrane, you've got something like 16,000 little hair cells distributed all along it. And it's, this basal membrane is like a piano. So the, the, the piano strings over here are, are narrow and they're very stiff. The, the, the piano strings over here are much thicker ones, they're wide, and they're fl more floppy. So that's what, this, there's a mechanical difference between the, the, the best member over here and over here, and that's what allows the wave to change its maximum for different frequencies. So this is very important because how you hear a particular frequency, if I, I, I have a, 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 a high frequency um, note or a low frequency note, either high or low, um, you, you're hearing that difference in sound, not because you're actually hearing that frequency. The neurons aren't transmitting that frequency. It is just different neurons are firing, okay? You hear high whenever anything hits, like activates this, this, these, these, these hair cells, and you hear low over here, a low frequency, whenever anything activates these hair cells. So it's, it's like uh, um, you're being able to detect different textures depending on which afferent is activated on the, on the touch. Here you, you, you detect 
different frequencies depending on which afferent is active. So the, the, the sound frequency is coded by where on this basal membrane you have the maximum vibration. It's a topogra topographical representation. And it, one way of describing it, it's place code. So each of these 16,000 hair cells, their activation tells you a particular frequency is, is, is present. Um, so it, it's, it's like that labeled line in touch. You feel different tech, types of touch. Now, what you saw there was the sound being loud or the sound being soft. And what happened there, the vibration got large for the loud sound and small for the soft sound. So frequency, it's which one's firing. Loudness is how, 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 how what, what the amount of action potentials, how frequent those vibrations are. So loudness is by frequency. And then of course, when you hear something complicated like that piece of music, it's all these things active at the same time. I don't know if any of you played with something called a synthesizer. And a synthesizer usually has the display looking like this where each bar here, they go up and down each of these bars, depending on what's being played. And each bar tells you how much of a particular frequency there is. So you've got, you got, you got certain frequency sounds, these go up, other frequency sounds, these go up. So this basal membrane is like one of these synthesizers. It decodes all the frequencies into the activation of different hair cells. And then, it, it, depending on how much vibration is being produced, you get to hear different loudness of that, that particular frequency. Now, you can, you can hear hearing loss that's not infrequent. And um, an extremely loud sound, like a, an explosion or um, somebody shooting a gun off beside your ear, can do a number of things. It can break the eardrum. It can uh, uh, break the, the basal membrane. And of course, it can uh, uh, break the ossicles, these bones that connect to it. A little less of a loud sound can damage the hair cells. It can wipe the, the hairs off the hair cells or at the very least, break some of those filaments that connect those flaps that allow potassium to flow in and out. The other thing that can happen is fluid can fill this middle ear. This is what happens when you have some sort of ear infection. That fluid filling, filling this part. And of course, your hearing will be affected because that, that will cause the air molecule to hit the water molecule here before the ossicles. So the ossicles, uh, won't, this, this eardrum won't be moved as much or a very tiny amount because most of the uh, energy of the air will simply bounce off this, this water interface, fluid interface. The other thing that can happen is these uh, flaps, when they open, they're not very selective. So potassium can flow in, um, but also all kinds of other substances can flow in. And one of the substances is as antibiotics. Um, some of the antibiotics that were prescribed for infections would enter these cells that actually kill the hair cells. And you could get death from 
a dose of antibiotics. And finally, old age. You hear, could hear a creepy sound if you listen carefully. That's old age. Um, things that wear out. Um, if you lack, your blood supply isn't going to this area um, enough. Um, the hair cells will die, and, and of course, these hair these cells aren't replaced once once they've been damaged. Um, they can't, there's no, no new cells will grow in in the course of one's life lifetime. Okay, what are the cues of sound direction? I'd like to try something. I'm gonna run over this cord. I think. Okay. Point again. And you can open your eyes to see if you're pointing correctly. Close again. And point again. Okay, open your eyes. So, how did you do that? How did you know where I was? And so you can make comparisons. Your ear actually makes two different types of comparisons. Now, if we had stereo, you could hear the sound moving across the room, just like I did. And one of the comparisons you make is how loud the sound is. You can see if the sound hits this ear directly, um, it has a larger effect than the other ear because the other ear is in the shadow. So your head acts like a shadow and produces, um, blocks, muffles the sound. And this works best, so this way of detecting sound works best for high frequencies. Sound yeah. Low frequencies, what they if I would just use a low frequency sound, it would wrap around the head and it wouldn't cast any shadow. So high frequencies use this you, the brain uses this technique, the shadow effect, which which ear hears gets a louder signal compared to loud. The other way is timing. You can see that you're hitting this ear first and then this ear second. Now, these sound waves are, 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 are travel a lot faster than you see in this picture. Uh, they, they travel with the speed of sound. So there's only something like um, a tenth of a millionth of a second difference between this year and that year. And the neat thing about the, the ears, or the, or the whole auditory system, is that it can detect that small difference in timing. Now, if we go back to the uh, the flap that opens in uh, of the of different hair cells, allowing the potassium to enter. That flap, it's a mechanical thing. It happens as soon as something, that hair cell gets bent. And it's that mechanical effect that allows you to be able to detect such small difference between the timing in one ear and the timing in the other ear. It's one of the factors. Now the other thing is we've got this 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 thing at, at the end of our ears that has these funny rings in it and whatnot. And those rings are there for a purpose. They make sounds coming from different directions, from in front of you versus in back of you, different. They allow you to hear better for things in front. But they also you're able to use them to detect so sounds, sound differences from below 
or above you. So they act like antennas. The other thing that you can do is you can move your head. As I moved across the room, I don't know if you've noticed, but your head's rotated. You, you pointed your heads at me. Okay. Um, and, and, and you can turn your heads to where the sound is loudest and use that as a clue of where sounds are. The other thing is that sound has a big effect on your other modalities, like, like vision, um, and it can mislead you. So, for example, um, these other modalities, or I should say, the other modalities can mislead you. So, if we, for example, look at a ventriloquist, he's got this little thing he's moving here, moving the mouth, this little thing. And the fact that the mouth is moving, you automatically direct the sound, the source of the sound to what's, what's moving. The same thing in a movie. Uh, if you see actors' lips moving, your brain directs the source to where that, 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 those, those actions occur. And we'll show you just later on how it can mislead you even further. Now, you've got these hair cells and they're vibrating either more or less or different, slightly different timing. This one first, this one second. Well, the first place where these two signals meet is here in the superior olivary nucleus. And this superior, superior olivary nucleus has two different parts. It has a lateral part and a medial part. The lateral part is involved in measuring the differences in intensity. So whether the, 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 the loudness of sound is producing a higher frequency of action potentials on one side versus the other side. The other thing it, it does is the medial portion is looking to see if there's any timing difference. If this action potential is coming sooner than this action potential. From there, the information flows first to the inferior colliculus. Remember, the inferior colliculus uh, is, is located near the superior colliculus, just below it. The superior colliculus was where, uh, if you see something in your peripheral vision, you turn your head towards it, this, this grasp reflex, or turns your eye towards it. Well, the inferior colliculus does the same thing for sound, and then it sends a signal to the superior colliculus so you can turn your eye or your head towards the sound. It also goes first to the thalamus, like every other proper sensory modality, and then to your cortex, and goes to the region called the primary auditory cortex. And this is where we have first have the the conscious perception of sound. Now, okay, question, a quiz question. Again, if you could try to answer this by hitting the table as hard as you can. Okay, what you have here is one action potential here, then a pause and two action potentials, then a pause and three actions, then four, then five all about a millisecond apart. What is this? Is this five similar sounds are played one every one millisecond? I gather nobody likes that one. Five, five sounds of increasing frequency are played. Nobody likes that one either. Okay, five sounds of increasing intensity are played. Okay, some, some Reluctant, not very enthusiastic yesers. Okay, one sound of a thousand hertz is played. So, and finally, five sounds are played, shifting from left to right. So this is one one sound on the left, and finally this is sound on the right. No one. I'll say yes. And look at that. I'm right. Okay. 
Yes. So as you play, it could be that the loudness increases. So as, again, it's important to remember that loudness is coded by the frequency of action potentials. But it could be also that the sound changes the location from the left to the right. And as a consequence, it will get over here, it'll be muffled in one ear, and then travel over to the other ear, and that ear will hear it louder. So the same mechanism, but to produce these two different effects. Okay. Where, what, what happens in the primary auditory cortex? Well, remember we had this basilar membrane where we had the, the low frequency portion and the high frequency portion. Well, that whole basilar membrane is, is sort of represented in this primary auditory cortex. We've got a low frequency end and a high frequency end. So if we got into a column over here, it'd be all low. If we got into a column over here, it'd be all high. So again, you've got a, a tonotopic, tonotopic representation, like you had in your basilar membrane. So, and the eye would be a retinotopic. Over here in the auditory cortex, it's tonotopic. Now, so sounds are first processed in this thing called the primary auditory cortex, or A1. After that, they go to a place called A2. Um, now, what's different about what's different about, about the sounds of this thing here versus the sounds of this thing? A1 will act, be activated by any sound. A2 is different. It'll be only activated by things that are word-like in nature. And by word-like, I mean things like pa, ga. And you will find out that these are things called phonemes. They're the building blocks. They're, they're, it's like your, your, um, uh, your area LOC. Um, it's it, it, the parts of objects. So this is the parts of, of sounds that are words. Now, the, this thing here is the core area, and this thing around it is called the belt. And within these two areas, it, it isn't just one um, compartment, but about a dozen mirror like tonotopic representations. So they, they, there's very complicated circuitry be, between those. They're not just single areas, but over a dozen little areas. Like V1, we can imagine like V1, V2, V3, but now we go up to v V12 in here. From here, you go from parts of words to whole words. So this is where word comprehension takes place. Now, going back to phonemes. The remarkable thing is, if you're a newborn, you can hear every phoneme that exists. Okay. So all over the world, anywhere, everyone, every child that's born, hears the same set of phonemes. Now, this uh, lady called Patricia Crew, uh, she found that at the age of six months, the auditory system starts filtering. So what is filtering mean? Well, try saying ba pa. Ba pa. You can see a very small little difference where your lips are. Ba 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 like that. Pa 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 like that. Very small difference. It's a very small difference in the sound that you hear. And you only hear one or the other, not something some third sound in between. And that's because of these, these filters. They act like magnets. Anything like this ba, so I can sort of get my lips or ba 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 in between. You hear one or the other, not anything in between. So these magnets uh, pull these different sounds in. 
I'm gonna make this clear boundary. Ba 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 pa 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 pa. Now what you saw there was a little baby, and uh, it was hearing different sounds. It started out with ba ba ba. The way the baby was awake, and then as this ba 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 kept repeating, it fell asleep, and then the ba switched to pa. The baby then woke up, and uh, and uh, again stayed awake for a little bit of time, then fell asleep again. So that's what 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 uh, first of all Peter Imus found, and then Patricia Cool and her students used. To be able to tell that that yeah something's happening in babies, something's changing, they went around with these recordings like you just heard, all over the world, and looked at babies' responses to these changes in phonemes. And what they had is these little pacifiers that were connected to something that would record their, the, the 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 amount of sucking the baby would have, and they'd have a, a record then of when the baby was asleep versus when it was awake. And they could then play all these different sounds and be able to tell that there's a difference between a young baby before the age of six months and an older baby past the age of six months <coughs> and see that something changed. So in the beginning they found that every child in, on earth could hear the same set. As the, uh, the child got older, he would continue to hear the sounds around him, you know. And the sounds that weren't around him, he <coughs> lost the ability to hear. So the phonemes that didn't exist in this climate disappeared. So, for example, if you're in English, uh, you, you continue hearing this R and L, okay. And you can move again instead of ba and ba. You try saying an R, your tongue's way back there. L, the tongue is up at your teeth. You're just moving back and forth. And you can roll your tongue, try this at home, rolling your tongue back and forth. And you're here at one point, either an R or an L, nothing in between. Because you've got this magnet. Now, if you're in Japan, there is no phoneme difference between R and L. Okay. So they, they only produce, the, I forget, one or the other is absent. Uh, I think probably the R. Um, and so if you grow up in Japan, you can't tell the difference between an R and L. You can't hear that difference. That, that phoneme doesn't exist. Similarly, there's a lot of phonemes uh, in Japanese language that we can't hear because we haven't in North America and your youths have not been exposed to them. Not because we have some exceptional ability, just as the exposure in the first six months. So, let's, let's look at the sequence of activity when we try to look at something and read out loud what it is that we see, something that I'm trying to do now. So the first step is you see with your eyes, and of course the signal goes back here into the visual cortex, and then over here in the higher order areas, like V2, V3, and it starts recognizing features, like uh, these, that this is a line, this is a curve over here, and so all those features get analyzed over here. And then information flows under the brain to an area called the visual word form area, this for short. And this area is on the left side. And it's, if you look at a word, you, your eye is over here, one part of the word is, word is on one side, is coded by the retina. On one side, of your, one side of your retina, 
the other part of the word, word is on the other side of the retina. And those get sent to opposite sides of the brain. So the word isn't seen by one cortex, it's seen by two cortex. But in this visual form area, these two sides get together again. It crosses the corpus close on one side. Now, this thing is located, this, this word form area, is located near where the fusiform face area it would be located. Um, but only on the left side. So it, it would appear that the left side of the fusiform face area is being taken over from face recognition to word recognition. So whatever it is that, that we're doing to be able to read is using the talent of your face area to do it. Now you can imagine that makes somewhat sense. Um, the, the ability to read has evolved very recently in, 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 in the history of man. Um, I think to be so, so that most people would read didn't occur until about a century ago. So we have only about a century of pushing everyone being able to read and pushing that genetic uh, lever uh, to develop this area. And that, that kind, of, kind of development doesn't occur out of nothing. It's being taken over by this area that can recognize faces. Now, if you had a lesion, my mouse seems to disappear. Okay, I'll move it this way. It's okay. Uh, no, it, it, it must be running out of batteries. So if we got rid of the FFA on the right, you have, would have prosopagnosia. You wouldn't be aware of nice faces. If you have a lesion here, you have something called dyslexia. You have a reading disability. Now from there, you go to the PTO association area, um, where visual, auditory, and tactile information is combined. And so you could uh, see an apple, or um, the picture of an apple, it could be written down, or uh, you can hear somebody chewing on an apple, all those things would be able to denote this object called an apple. You could taste it. Then information flows to this Wernicke's area, where the sound of a word is generated. Okay? It's the, your internal representation of what apple sounds like. And now you can remember that we had um, this biological motion um, sensing capability. So you can, you can see whether a person is walking, you can tell the gait, you can recognize the person. But you could also be able to recognize lips. Let me show, show you. So for example, when you hear a ba or a ga, what your lips see influences your perception. So, from there, the information flows to a structure called Broca's area. And Broca's area is involved in verbal expression. Um, it's also located here in the frontal lobe, so it's involved in forming the grammar of the words. So it's putting, uh, making sure the subject comes first, then the verb, then the, then the, then the object and um, putting it together with the right grammar. So the word order. And from there, information flows to the facial area. You can imagine your homunculus is, is over here. Um, over here is where the face is, your tongue was. So it, it's this area then moves the, the lips and moves the tongue and contracts your vocal cords and produces sound. What happens if you have damage of these two very important areas, Wernicke's and then Broca's? 
if you have damage to Wernicke's area, you have you cannot understand language. Okay? So you can't when you hear the spoken word, you uh, you can't understand it. You can still say a word because this part is in effect. Okay? But what you say is often nonsense. If, on the other hand, you have a lesion here, um, you can't say the right grammar because this area that puts the words together is damaged. Um, and you have an inability to form, um, the, the, speak the words correctly, but you can't understand it. So if you hear it, um, you can understand what's being said. And more importantly, if you have this area damaged, you're trying to express things. Okay? You can't express them because Broca's is damaged, but you can hear that you're not saying it right. So it gets to be fairly frustrating. If you're deaf, you often are taught American Sign Language. So in American Sign Language, you speak through gesture, making gestures with your hands. Interesting enough, if you have damage to either of these two areas, you have the same deficits that someone that's trying to speak has. So if you have a damage of Broca's area, you have problems with your hand gestures. Okay. If you have a damage to Wernicke's area, you ha have difficulty um, in understanding these gestures. So it looks like these areas are not just, you know, uh, organized by sounds, but organized by sight as well. In addition, there is a what and where path stream for these, this theory. The what stream goes forward to the anterior part of the temporal lobe and then across the Broca's area. The where stream goes back to Wernicke's and then forward towards Broca's area. In, in the what stream, what the what stream does is identify the sound. So it, is this a sound that grandma's producing? So that type of identification. If you're looking at the where stream, it's worried about all the rest of the qualities of the sound, its location and its temporal properties, the frequency. And that's, of course, what you need in order to detect the, the, what word is being spoken. When babies babble, they, they use the activation of both these areas uh, to be able to perceive, to develop their own language. Activating these two streams in, in babbling activates the learning process of being able to both produce sounds and detect what, this, what the sound sounds like. And that's it for today. Thank you very much.